Everybody. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning, this Father's Day morning. All right, I have a little bit of a word to share. This gentleman was sharing online um, the, the great relationship that he had with his teenage child. He said his teenager treats him like a god, which means that his teenager ignores him until he wants something. All right? And we all understand that fatherhood and parenthood is a thankless job. It's a lot of work, and every now and then you might get a good tie out of it, a good card drawn, right? Maybe some macrame, maybe some macaroni art, something along the lines as a reward for our tireless 24-hour service, right? But I think it is inaccurate to say that it is a full-time job. Um, the full-time job has different implications. There's no dental program with this, right? I think it's more accurate to say that fatherhood is a, an unpaid internship where for the first five years, uh, you bring your boss their meal and half the time they just throw it on the floor, all right? But nonetheless, there are great rewards in it, great long-term rewards where we get to see a child grow up. We get to see a little bit of your own image flourish into another generation, into the future, and see what God has in store for that child as we develop them in the way that they should go. There's beautiful blessings in that, just as there are beautiful blessings for our Father in Heaven who identifies Himself as such. We have a blessed trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And the interesting thing about this, as we go through the names of God and see God through various lenses of different identities that he has revealed to us through his blessed word, we discover that many of the names, a whole bunch of names apply to God the Son. In fact, I used to, when I was growing up as a kid in my room, I had a poster that listed just a whole bunch of names about Jesus, right? And the various names that were given by Jesus. Jesus is is a God of many wonderful names. And the Holy Spirit, he's got a handful as well, but interestingly enough, there's also a whole bunch of names for the Godhead, for the Trinity in Toto, but when it comes to God the Father, the sole identity in which we encounter God the Father is as God the Father. Now, a lot of us, we think in our minds when we say God, 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 we think God, God the Father, right? Usually that's where we go to first, and, and in many ways we will see that as Yahweh or Elohim or all these things, but in truth, Yahweh is the whole of the Godhead, the whole of the Trinity. Did Jesus not reveal himself as the great I Am throughout especially the Gospel of John? No, the only way in which we encounter the person of God the Father is exclusively in a relationship with Him as The Father. And the name of God that we are going to be exploring today is the name Abba. Say it with me now. Abba. Abba is a beautiful name for God. Abba, which of course means Father. It is not to be confused with the more well-known Abba, which was a Swedish rock group, which you might be familiar with. All right, But they were named in no way after uh, Abba Father. They are actually named as an acronym for the names of the singers in the band. Uh, let's see, is it Angrith, uh, Bjorn, Benny, and Frida. Don't ask me how that adds up to Abba, but nonetheless, here we have. But Mamma Mia, here we go again. We will not be dealing with Abba. Instead, we'll be focusing on God the Father and the gift of God the Father. Now, Abba is a Hebrew word which means father, and as a result of that and the understanding of him as father, we get the word abbot, which you may have encountered in medieval times with monks uh, and that type of thing, and that comes from the same root word meaning father. But we're going to dive into Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, looking at verses 29 through 31, to start this off with and set the tone, ladies and gentlemen. See, Romans chapter 1 is probably the most famously known for its, its verse in Romans 1, 20, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? And that is honestly what the whole of chapter of Romans, and when you think about it, the whole of the book of Romans is truly about. And in the midst of Romans chapter 1, as we're first getting the wonderful proclamation from Paul that we should not be ashamed of the gospel, we see the consequences immediately after that of a world that is ashamed of the gospel. We see all of the, 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 the defilement, the degradation, uh, the depravity that is in the world when those are ashamed of the gospel and they live their lives according to the shame as opposed to the glory of the gospel. But in the midst of it, it tells everything that in Romans 1, the Romans first century world was very much like because they had yet to receive Christ. And as we receive Christ and the world changed and now the world is changing from Christ. And as we secularize our culture and our world and we push the gospel of Jesus Christ out of the forefront, out of our culture, out of our our zeitgeist, and we become more ashamed as our culture of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are seeing those old bad ideas return and the consequences that depravity returns as well. And in the midst of it, if you want to understand why the world is messed up, 
If you want to understand why all the things that I'm about to list are happening in this world that we can see in the day, it's because we are ashamed of the gospel. We are ashamed of listening to God, right? And it says in Romans chapter 1, all right, ver- beginning with verse 29, it's going to tell us everything that's wrong with the world. And what, as it was then, we are seeing it now again. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And I love about that is in the midst of all these terrible sins, right? All these terrible sins, it just throws out there disobedient to parents. And it may feel a little bit of like one of these things is not like the others because we're talking about destroying culture, destroying civilization. And then in the midst of it, big emphasis, disobedient to parents, right? I always like to emphasize that one when I teach the young about that. Pay attention right here. You don't want to be like the bad guys, right? But in the midst of this, this really gets to the crux of it. If we are living our lives ashamed of the gospel, it's the gospel that reveals to us that God is our father. And as we are disobedient to parents, and as we see the consequences of that, as, as kids are growing with a little sass mouth, as kids are growing without any consequence or any reverence or respect for their parents, are we surprised in any way that our culture no longer has reverence or respect for God? For as you treat the one, as you treat your earthly parents, you're going to have the same reflection upon your spiritual father in heaven. And the way that you see as their culture treats fathers and fatherhood parallels strongly, mightily correlates with the way our culture treats God the Father. So if we are going to get things right, we need to understand that in the midst of that, that's not just a minor thing or a quibble or a little part. That's the whole kit and caboodle, is it not? And as we see that, that helps us to reflect a little bit more on God's top ten, the ten not suggestions but commandments, the fourth commandment of which was to honor thy father and thy mother. And that puts things in a slightly different light, doesn't it? That it's not just about being respectful to your elders. It's not just about your yes ma'ams and your your no sirs and all that. It's about establishing the tone for respect and reverence of authority over you. So as you show respect to those earthly fathers in your life that you can see, you will learn better reverence and respect for the spiritual father who is above us all. All right, It's directly correlated. Everything builds on top of it. Because we know God as Abba. And Abba, I said, means father, but I'm going to get a little more specific to you on that. Because technically, Ab means father, and we see that in many names. For instance, Abraham was named Abraham, the Abraham, because he was going to be the father of many, the blessed gift that God gave to him and fulfilled in him, first through Isaac and then Jacob, and then a whole mess of Hebrews that came out of that, right? But we also see the name Ab is, is, is a root word, and it means doesn't necessarily always refer to God or the blessings of God. It can also refer to just basically father is the everyday use of father. For instance, there is Abner, all right, which means Abner. Abner, which I love because he's listed in the Bible as Abner, son of Ner, which literally means son of my father's name is Ner, and I am the son of Ner, which lets us know that Ner was super creative when it came time to naming his son. He is Ner, I will name my son, my father is Ner. That way nobody is confused over whose kid this is, right? Lays it out very clear. Ab means father, so Abba means something a little bit different than father. You may have already heard, and you're like, I know where you're going with this. You may have heard it referred to as something a little bit more intimate, a little bit more personal, a little bit more loving. And usually we translate then, therefore, as daddy. That it's this more powerful thing. It's a closer relationship. It's not the distance. And it's interesting, of all of the, the, the trinity of the Godhead, when we think of, of distant, right, we think of God the Father sitting upon his throne. We think of him very kingly, very lordly, very transcendent. And yet we are supposed to know him not just as Father, but as Abba, as something that's actually even close and near and dear and personal. But I'm going to throw a little curveball. If you've heard it referred to as Daddy before, that's not technically correct. Because as a child, you call your dad daddy, right? But as you grow up and you get older, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a 37-year-old man that's going to refer to his father as daddy anymore, right? But usually you grow up, you mature, you come to dad, you know, and that's usually when the relationship dynamic kind of changes a little bit. You become a little bit more peers, and then there's a change there, right? But in the Hebrew, you would expect it if you refer to Abba, But even as a grown-up man, as an adult, you would still refer to your father as Abba. You see, it's not just a a daddy-to-dad situation. The Abba remains. And the closest translation to English that we would have is what we find more commonly in Europe than we find in America, and that is Papa. 
For someone growing up as a child referring to their father as Papa, as they get older, they will still lovingly refer to their father as Papa. All right, which is a wonderful thing because that just happens. To, I wish I could say it was intentional, but that's how I have my kids refer to me as Papa. Because as they get older and as they get even older and older and older, and then they, Connor becomes a Papa of his own and then Kayla has children of her own, I still get to be Papa. I wouldn't get to be Daddy as an old man, right? But I still get to be Papa. And the beautiful thing in that is that God's relationship doesn't change. You see, our relationship with our earthly fathers, it does shift a bit, doesn't it, right? As we go from, as we become into our own manhood, as we come into our own womanhood, as we become adults and we see things a little bit differently, and it's usually interestingly enough when that dynamic shifts is when we start to begin to understand the wisdom of our fathers. My favorite quote from Mark Twain, one I've shared with you before, is that Mark Twain said, when I was 14, my father knew nothing. When I was 21, I was amazed to discover how much he had learned in seven years, right? On the same note, as we get older, that dynamic changes, but we get to appreciate our fathers more, especially as we, in turn, gentlemen, become fathers and understand what they were trying to do, right? But with a papa, it doesn't change because, because Abba, he doesn't change. God, our father, does not change. And our relationship with him, praise God Almighty, that doesn't change. Because it would be kind of scary if our relationship with God changed. We don't want that. We want consistency. We want security. We want that gift that no matter what happens, whether I've skinned my knee, whether I've lost my job, whether I've lost myself, I can still cry out and and Papa will hear me and Papa will help me. And that I'll always have that close, intimate relationship with my Papa. Which is why I always like to say that, especially as peer pressure comes up and all their friends know they, they have dads and they, they don't, I don't know, Papa, it's different, no one else is calling it. And then they throw out and refer to me amongst their friends as, as my dad or my daddy. I'm like, who's dad? All right. I, I'm Papa. All right. Let's get this right. All right. And that helps us to understand our relationship better with God the Father. For He is our Papa. And that's the gift of Abba. And I'm glad of that because Papa doesn't change, which is good. And Papa's always superior to Daddy because, because there's Daddy issues in this world, aren't there? There really are. I, I wish it was the other way around, but there are father issues in this world. We can argue whether it was the chicken or the egg in this situation. We can argue whether that because of absentee fatherisms, because of unfit fathers, because of uncaring fathers, that's the reason why we have the reputation and the degradation that we see in our culture towards fatherhood. Or maybe now because it's being blasted and, and, and lessened in our culture so much that no one wants to stick around, no one wants to stand up and be that good father because it's a thankless job. We can make the argument, but the case remains is a lot of people don't have great relationships with their father. And for good or for ill, and gentlemen, it's a little pressure on you, a little weight on your shoulders. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's the truth. For good or for ill, we define our relationship with God the Father based upon our relationship with our fathers. For good or for ill, whether it was a great and loving relationship and He showed us everything and Father knows best, right? Or whether He did not do a good job at all. Or He wasn't present at all. And we wonder why people have a hard time grasping the concept as we present to us, here is our God, God is Father, and if they had an unhealthy relationship with Father, that actually puts up a barrier. And so it's understandable, to be fair, but to be fair, it's not fair at all. Because that's the dog, wag, the tail wagging the dog. That's putting the cart before the horse. That's getting things backwards. That's judging God based upon the actions of man when all of fatherhood should be in light of the example that God the Father gives to us. Because long before our father or our grandfather or our great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather ever walked the face of this earth, God the Father was always God the Father. And the institution of fatherhood was established and defined by Abba and the patient care that he demonstrated as he corrected Adam and Eve when they were naughty in the Garden of Eden. And he gave them the punishment that they needed to understand the consequences of their behavior. And still he loved them. And still patiently, he guides us towards him. So unfortunately, bad fathers give God a bad rap. And good fathers can help point in the right direction. But even more fortunately, no matter what your relationship with your particular father is, you are given a good and loving and wonderful, not just example, but reality and Abba in heaven. And God the Father who shows us the right thing that we need. Personally, I did not have a father in my life. But I had God the Father. 
And now I could easily have rejected and said, I don't understand what this is. I can't have any relationship. I don't know what this is. It means he's absent. So I guess God is absent. I could have pushed him away. But instead, fortunately, because of the wisdom and guidance of my mother, I was able to see God the Father as absolutely everything that I need. And whatever is missing in your life or missing with your relationship with your Father, God the Father is more than enough. And He is everything to show us the proper example of what fatherhood truly is, what love, what patience, what long-suffering care really is, and also what sacrifice is. There's another gentleman who's going to share with us a story about a not-so-great relationship with his father. It helps us to put it in the proper context. There's a, a man by the name of Professor Fred Craddock. Craddock, he, uh, not him, but the person that he's going to encounter in this story is going to tell us about the relationship with the father. See, while he was a professor, uh, he was traveling on vacation with his wife. They went to Gatlinburg, Tennessee for vacation just for the two of them. They went to a nice restaurant. They were hoping to have a nice private evening together. And as they sat down at the restaurant, they see a well-dressed gentleman with gray hair. And he's walking around. He's schmoozing the crowd. And he's talking table to table. And they immediately think to themselves, what every introvert's fear is, please don't come to my table. Please don't come talk to me. I don't know you. I don't want to have to put on the battery and, 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 and you know, give up my social energy to conversation. It's not that I have anything against you. It's just it's a drain, and I don't want you to come talk to me, right? And so the gentleman does, in fact, come to the table. He introduces, hi, my name is Ben Hooper. Um, who are you? How are you doing? Where are you guys from? They say, well, we're from Oklahoma. Oh, Oklahoma. I'm familiar. Uh, what do you do there? And he says, well, I'm a professor of homiletics at uh, the seminary, the graduate seminary down at Phillips University. He goes, homiletics, okay, so that means you, you teach the preachers, right? You're a teacher of preachers. And he says, yes, sir, uh, that is in fact what I do. And he says, oh, well, I, I got a, a preacher's story for you. And then, you know, that, that fear they had about him coming to the table was then just magnified even more as Fred Craddock reveals, oh, here we go. Everybody's got a preacher's story, right? And now I get to hear this guy. And the gentleman says, well, I grew up not far from here, in Tennessee, but I grew up without a father. Uh, I was born uh, out of wedlock, all right? I was illegitimate, and my entire neighborhood let me know about it every waking moment of my life, basically. Um, the other kids in the neighborhood had a technical term that they used for me that was not very nice, and he said that I didn't like going into town when I had to because that was the worst because I could feel all eyes on me, and I could hear the hush whispers of who is his father. And that really shaped his relationship with the whole of community and made him feel hurt, made him feel damaged, made him feel less. Well, there was a new preacher that came into town, and he would dutifully come to church on Sundays, right? But he would sneak in after all the meet and greet and everything, and he would listen to the sermon, and then as soon as the benediction was done, he would skedaddle from the back row because he didn't want to have to deal with anybody, right? Well, one Sunday after this gone on for a couple of weeks, he was in the back row as per usual, and then the pastor in the midst of his benediction, he cut it off really short. And I know you guys have no idea what that's like, but he cut off the benediction really short, and all of a sudden, uh, Ben in the back, he, he was stuck because he wasn't expecting. He didn't get to make his exit, and now he's surrounded by everybody, and everyone gets up and look, and he could see the muttered, the furtive glances. He could feel the weight of everyone's eyes upon him. He could feel the weight of their words. He could feel the weight of their shame metaphorically upon him, and then he felt literally the weight of a hand heavy upon his shoulder, and he looked up, and it was the new pastor. This is the first time that he had any conversation with the new pastor, and the pastor getting to him looks at him and says, who are you, son? Whose boy are you? And then he said, felt that same tension, that same weight, that same fear coming over him that he's going to get accosted again. He's now going to be judged and the new pastor is going to come on him again. But the pastor looks at him, there's a growing and a dawning smile upon his face, a smile of recognition. And the pastor looks down at him and says, oh, oh, I know who you are. I see the family resemblance. You're a son of God. And he says to him as he slaps him on the rump and sends him out, you've got a great inheritance awaiting you, lad. Go get it. Ben Hooper then turns to Mr. Craddock and he says that was the single most important sentence anyone had ever told him in his entire life. And then he smiled, thanked them for their time, and he got up and he went to the next table where he had either long-lost friends or everyone that he ever met was an old friend of his. We don't really know. But as he moved on, Fred Craddock then, as he's weighing now the, the twist in the story, as he's biting back those tears as someone must have been cutting onions in the back, right? As he suddenly realized the weight that he has on his shoulder now as a teacher of preachers and the the immense importance that they have in their communities and how they can shape lives. He then remembered where he had heard the name Ben Hooper before. Ben Hooper, you see, was the former governor of Tennessee. You are a son of God, and you have a great inheritance. Go get it. 
Beloved, our value is not determined by genetics. And as we get more hard science in our culture, as we get even more and more secular and genetics and the the truth of so many dystopian science fictions are becoming a reality, remember you are not the sum total of your genes. And your value is not determined by that. You are not determined either by your relationship with your earthly father. Your value is determined by your relationship with Abba and the love and the value that he places in your life by his relationship with you. What a blessing that God gets to be a part of our lives, but what an even greater blessing that we get to be a part of Abba's life. Amen? You see, in John 1, verses 12 through 13, in John chapter 1, most of the press, as far as the name of God gets, is the Word, right? The Logos. And we will get to that in the midst of the series. But not John 1, 1, or 2, or 3, but as we get a little bit further down, as John is introducing to us the concept of, of who Jesus is, he tells us the amazing gift, the reason why Jesus came to this world, the reason why we were gifted with the Messiah is the Messiah came bearing a gift for us. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I'm going to reiterate that. Not only do we have the right to be children of God, and I love that, and before that we're going to back up a little bit and understand that everyone is created by God, but not everyone is a child of God. John 1 makes it very clear. Not everyone is a child of God. If you say everyone's a child of God, you are misstepping on the word. Only those who believe in the name of the Son of God, who believe in Messiah Jesus Christ, they have been gifted with now the right, the God-given inalienable right to become a child of God. And now that we are a child of God, we understand that we have been born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. We have been born of God. We have been born not of blood, or rather, not of our blood, or our blood relatives, We've been born by the blood of Jesus Christ to now be a child of God. It was not by the will of the flesh nor of the will of man. I don't know if you've looked around and seen the will of man lately. And I don't know if you've looked back into your past and seen the will of flesh. The will of flesh doesn't do such a great job at all. Right? You know, so when you look and we discover who the, the arch nemesis in your life, the one who's been causing all your problems, it was you. Because <laughs> we make bad decisions. We get ourselves in a mess is that God gets us out of the will. The flesh is not our friend, it is our enemy. And the will of man is not to choose God. But praise God, it is not up to the will of the flesh, the will of man, or our blood. Praise God that it is God's choice. And through here we discover something very, very important. As we are now adopted in sonship in, by God the Father, as Abba now is now our Father, we need to understand that He picked us. When you go into an adoption house, you know that, yes, eventually, if it's a good adoption agency, it's a good orphanage, they'll ask the kid, do you want these people to be your parents, especially if they're old enough of being aged to be able to say that? And hopefully, they'll be in a relationship and say, yes, I want them, right, and establish it. But before they are there, the reason why they are in the position to be able to say, I want this man to be my father, is first the father went to the orphanage and said, I want him to be my son. We get to pick God, yes, but before we pick God, God picked us. And praise God that God chose us, that God picked us, that God looked upon us and said, that there is my son. So yes, the Calvinists have it right in that regard, but before they get a little too high on the hog, let's jump to a counter verse here, and that's going to be Matthew 18, 14. Matthew 18, 14 is going to be the parable of the lost sheep. Y'all remember that from youth, right? Parable of the lost sheep. Interesting enough, in Luke, it's all about, you know, sinners being lost, and then the one leaves and the 99 are left behind by the shepherd who goes and searches out the one and brings them back. But the context in Matthew, when that same parable is given, is not just of the lost, but specifically of little ones, of children. Suffer the little ones that they may come to Christ. Don't keep them from Jesus. Bring the little ones because Jesus wants all the little ones to come. And the reason why he says, the reason why he says it is in Matthew chapter 18, verse 14. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. 
As we're talking about not of the blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but the will of God. The will of God is that no one should perish. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's God's will that none should perish. But all of them, as a little one, coming to Him, and you say, this is just when they're kids, right? No, no. If you are to enter the kingdom of God, you must become like one of these little ones. Like a child only can we enter into the kingdom of God. Like a child only can we see God as Abba proclaim Papa and be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ who gives us the opportunity to be adopted by God and have a new father, a new relationship. God doesn't want any of these little ones to perish. Back in 1985, there was a, a massive earthquake near Mexico City. It was an 8.0 it was absolutely devastating, and it caused widespread destruction. Uh, I think early estimates were 5,000 people died because it's not just the shaking of the ground, but the buildings collapsed. And one of the buildings that collapsed in on itself was a hospital. And that's terrible as we think of all the sick and in the infirm, but it's not just sick and infirm who go to the hospital these days because we no longer have a little bit farm life or midwife. Instead, most people are born in hospitals, and there was a nursery. And that nursery was collapsed in on itself. And they didn't have the equipment or the ability to, to, they needed international help. It took many days for that help to get there and arrive. And there were so many other problems. And as they're clearing the rubble and they're expecting the worst and they're just prepared to see the terrible things. And as they finally get to where the nursery is and they reveal that, that, that the babies are alive. That after seven days, seven days without food, water, warmth, or even human touch, 16 out of the 14 newborn babies were alive. 16. And out of those 14 survived beyond that. 14 babies that there is no scientific possibility for them to have survived that long. And so they are called miracle babies for with God all things are possible. And because of this awesome miracle, many of those children, I mean, they had injuries, they had wounds, many of them had to have surgery, some even amputations. And some of them, most of them even lost mothers, but they still had fathers. And some of them that lost mothers and fathers in the surrounding damage, but they had uncles who became their fathers, or grandfathers who became their fathers, or no one and were adopted because someone said, I want to be a father of that miracle child that God preserved. Because it's not the will of the Father that any of the little ones should perish. Because God has a heart for children and wants all children to come to Him and understand who He is to them, who He is to us. In Hebrews 2.10, Paul, it's probably Paul, relates to us that, that God, God came to us and through suffering would bring many sons to glory. And I love that phrase. That Jesus, the Son of God, the rightful heir, the perfect one, the holy one, the worthy one, the one to whom all glory is owed, He wanted to bring many sons to glory. And not just Him. He wanted His brothers, He wanted His sisters to receive the glory that comes from the Father, the glory that comes from relationship with the Father. So He suffered for the sake of us, that many sons would be brought to glory. And we need that because as I explained earlier, not everyone is a child of God. All right? That's not the default state we must become. We must gain the right that only came through the suffering of the Christ because before that, we had not such a great relationship. And I'm not talking about our earthly fathers. I'm talking about something much worse. In John chapter 8, uh, Jesus goes and, and, you know, that politically correct Jesus, right? He's going in and he's just having great conversations with everybody. He says whatever they want to hear and no one has any issues with Jesus at all, right? Well, in John chapter 8, Jesus, the most politically incorrect person in all of history, is confrontational to the Pharisees, all because he proclaims that he's doing the will of his Father and they take offense to that. They don't like that, that he is making himself a son of God and therefore like unto God. So they get in his face and he gets right back in their face and he explains to them that as they try and say, well, Abraham's our father. If Abraham was really your father, then you would follow Abraham and do what Abraham did. And Abraham listened to me, by the way. Abraham believed in me, but you want to kill me. You want to kill me because because you are doing the deeds of your father and he looks them all in the eye and says that their father is Satan. 
like I said, public relations, political correctness, say whatever anybody needs to hear to sit in the seat, right? You can't offend people. You can't offend people with truth or harsh reality. And he lets people know that until you are adopted as a son of God, you are a son of Satan. And in so doing, in our rebellious nature, in living after the devil and living in the ways of the world, we blaspheme the holy and beautiful name of Abba by applying it unworthily to the devil and falling after his image and his example. We need the gift of the blood to transform us. We need to stop falling after the will of man, which is Satan as Abba, and the will of the flesh, which is Satan as Abba. We need to stop relying on our blood relations because that was the problem of the Pharisees saying, well, Abraham was our father, so we're good, as they look God in the eye and miss the whole point because they miss the will of God that they too would be saved. That they too would see the gift and have a true Father in heaven instead of one in hell. Now all of that now brings us to the crux of the matter as we now get to where Abba really shows up in the text. And now you're all looking at your watch and saying, that was all the introduction? All right. So now our sight text for today all right, is Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Mark 14, 36. The Gospel of Mark chapter 14 is in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Destiny. Wherein Jesus Christ, having finished the Last Supper, which He knew to be the Last Supper, and the disciples didn't know what was going on, awaiting Judas Iscariot to come into that faithful garden, bringing the guards with Him to the garden, He prays a prayer. He's got Peter, He's got James, He's got John with Him, and He asks them to watch and pray, but they don't. They fall asleep. And that's where we get the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that right there encapsulates the whole of the need of the gospel right there. They want to do the right thing. They want to be with Jesus. They want to support Jesus. They want to help him accomplish his ministry, but they fall asleep. And so Jesus is going to pray a prayer to God the Father. And any time that God prays, shouldn't we pay attention to that and understand the great mysteries? Because right here is the single most important prayer ever prayed in the midst of that garden. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And here, right here, is the very first time that Abba shows up in the text. This is where Jesus utters Abba as a phrase in the midst of the prayer. Abba, Father. Because this is Jesus, as we are told earlier in that chapter, He was greatly distressed and troubled. He said Himself, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. He is in the midst of the greatest anxiety of His life and the weakness of His flesh, the weakness of Himself as God as man demonstrated there does not diminish what He does. It glorifies instead what He does because this wasn't just no big deal. This wasn't, yeah, I'm going to die, but I'm going to get better. I know the plan. It's going to work out great. This is letting us know that it was serious and it was real and if it was is real to him than the gift, the sacrifice was real. And Jesus shows us also that when we are sorrowful, when we are troubled, when we are just filled with so much sorrow, even to death, we should not be afraid, we should not worry, we should not fret, we should pray. And who do we pray when we're worried about things that are coming? Who do we pray to when we are sorrowful and in need of comfort and strength and encouragement? We pray to Abba, Father. Personal, intimate. He is referred to God as the Father so often. But Father can be impersonal. Father can be distant. Father can be technical. It is in the midst of this prayer that Jesus says, Abba. And he prays to his Papa. And he says, All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. This cup of wrath. The cup that he was born as man for. The cup of the consequence of every sin ever committed and ones that had not yet been committed that he knew that he was coming to drink and drink in full. 
yet not what I will, but what you will. If there's any way, because all things are possible with you, if there's any other way for us to accomplish this mission, and it's not saying that he didn't want to die for us, he was saying he didn't want to die because it was real and it would be painful. And the next 12 some hours of his life would be absolute terrible, a misery that no man has ever experienced. Because yes, the rejection was bad. Yes, the shame was bad. Yes, withstanding the lies was bad. Yes, the death and the torture was bad. But what truly came was the consequence of sin. Death. And He was there when death was born in a different garden because of the disobedience of man. Because death, the consequence of sin, the wages of sin is separation from God. And he knew that his Abba would be separated from him from that weekend as he went into the very depths of hell for us. If there's any other way that we can accomplish this mission, but nevertheless, I will do my duty. I will fulfill my task. I will do the will of my Father in heaven. And it's the most important prayer that was ever prayed because He demonstrates the whole of the Gospel. He says to the disciples, the the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But He allowed His flesh not to be weak, but in the midst of the greatest burden upon Him, found His strength. We do not know because our flesh is still weak. In the midst of this great burden, knowing that God can do all things and please do something else, He said what Adam did not do. Adam, who was called Son of God in a different garden, did not obey God. But on account of the disobedience, reaped the consequence that Jesus long ago knew that He would always be the one to pay for. In this other garden, in the night, not hiding from God, but going directly to Him and calling Abba by name, He proclaims the ultimate act of not disobedience, but obedience to overturn our sin and its consequence. Because He would take that cup and He would drink it in full so there wasn't even a drop of God's wrath left for any of His other children. Because He obeyed the Father entirely and He did it for our sake for the sake of those who would get to be called who would have the right after He drank the cup to be called children of God. In Romans 8, verses 14 and 15, is the second time that Abba is used. It's given to us by Paul. In the midst of Romans chapter 8, he's talking about how we get to be heirs with Christ. And if you've ever really sat for a minute and thought about that in its depths, it should absolutely blow your mind. That we get to be co-heirs with Christ. That we would be elevated to receive the glory of the only one who is worthy. And Paul explains it to us in Romans 8, verses 14 and 15. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope I'm going to once again reiterate that the Bible is not politically correct. Your translation may say that you get to be referred to adopted as children or get to be a spirit of God or children of God. That is not the case. The actual word in the Greek is sons of God and that's important because Paul's in the midst of talking about inheritance. And under the law of Roman law and Hebrew law, the inheritors were sons. So this was a gift, not an exclusion of women, but an inclusion of women elevating you that you would gain the inheritance as a son for you were adopted as a son and receive the full measure of the gifts of God. The full measure by which everyone, male and female, Greek and Hebrew, slave and free, all of us, one and the same, get to cry out, Abba, Father. And see how it parallels what came before. Because we're talking about the sacrifice which leads to the adoption. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6. He's going to reiterate this for us. And the last time that Abba is, is given to us here, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Beloved, do you know what that means? The adoption of sons that we may cry out, Abba, Father, as Jesus cried out, Abba, Father. The power of adoption. Adoption isn't seen in the same light in ancient first century and even before that Hebraic culture as we see it now. Sadly, we see it as a lesser thing. It's a different thing. It's not a biological son, but you're a son. So, you know, and you get all the shows, that say, well, you're not my real dad and all that nonsense. Well, did he raise you? Did he love you? Did he patch up your knee? Did he teach you? Did he provide for you? Did he give you food? Then he's your real dad. Genetics don't matter at that point. And they are much wiser in the ancient times with regard to this. If you adopted, you were their father. Biology was completely transformed and retroactively the moment you adopted that child, you were their real father. Full and true, biology ceased to exist in their perspective. Adoption was so much more significant. Naming the child, calling them your oars, that was everything. Now there was a blogger by the name of, uh, let's see here, Tommy Harris, and he was explaining that he and his wife, they're going through the adoption process. And they had their 10-day-old son that they had just adopted. You know, they started the process. They just had custody of him just two days prior. And then on his 10th day, they had to take him to a hospital. They had went to the best doctor that they could find because their family practitioner recommended that they get a more thorough inspection. He saw some irregularities that he was concerned with, and they discovered there was a murmur upon the child's heart that could lead to very severe consequences. They could completely alter the way that he lived. It could even alter how long that he could live, and they were, they were terrified. And so they went to the doctor hoping to not hear anything, but it was there. And they said that this may be a complication. It could cause problems throughout the child's life. I'm gonna, he didn't bury the lead. He just straight up to say that that was 31 years ago and their son is healthy and happy. But a few months after that, as they were finalizing the process, they went to the judge and the judge called them into his chambers and sat them down and had a conversation with them and says, this is your last chance. If you want to back out, If you don't want this child, if you want to go anywhere else, this is your last chance to do it. Because once you sign these papers, once you sign this contract, this child is irrevocably yours and cannot be undone. Interestingly enough, there are more protections for a child of adoption than a natural born child. Because you can disown a natural born child. You cannot disown a child that you have chosen. You cannot disown a child that you have adopted. And even though they had the problems with the health, and maybe some people would want to think, if you're so focused secularly on genetics and the importance of that, and having the best and the strongest kid, if you're going to live into a Gattaca future, that many people would have had second thoughts about that. They had no hesitation. They said, this is our child, and we will love him for as long as God gifts him with us. And they signed the contract then and there, and praise Jesus, they said, he was ours. This was our son, and no one could take that away. And he said, that's exactly what happens with God. For God signed a contract. God signed a covenant for us and He used the blood of Jesus Christ to sign it. And because we are adopted now as sons, there is, there's no going back on that. There's no taking that away. There is no losing that salvation. Once you are His, once you cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, He is forever, for Abba never changes. And that relationship never goes away. And the roots of it, we can see, we can go back as we were going through our private study, honey, as we were looking through and David, as he goes through in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and the covenant that is laid upon him, the Davidic covenant, where God gives him a great promise. David wanted to build him a temple. He said, it's not for you, it'll be for your son, but because you wanted to build me a house, I'll build a house for you. Not one of, 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 of wood and stone, but of flesh and bone. And he gives him a great promise in the Davidic covenant. He says, as you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and verse 14, he says, And I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And that's good that he gave that promise. 
Because if you'll recall, as we were looking through the genealogy of Jesus Christ, as we were looking through the many kings that came through and that came after David, they were messed up. There was a handful that were pretty good or all right, but most of them were bad. Most of them did worse stuff than Saul. But because of the promise, because of the covenant, because of the adoption of David and his heirs, God did not forsake them when He was given every good reason to do so. God did not cast them aside, but held on to them as we held on to time until the coming of Jesus Christ until we came on to the true heir, until we came on to the true gift and the promise by whom many sons would come to glory. God did not give up on us. No matter how many times we disappointed our Father, He never gave up on us. Because Abba does not change. And the relationship doesn't change either. And through all this, through all this we see something powerful. We see favoritism. You know, when we look and we see great fathers in the Bible, Jacob is not one of them. For Jacob showed great favoritism towards Joseph. And he let everybody know it. He gave him a coat of many colors. And boy, did the rest of his brothers not appreciate that, J- that Joseph was the favorite to the point where Joseph wound himself into a well and all sorts of complications and all sorts of difficulties, largely that was born out of the favoritism, the poor fatherhood that Jacob showed to his other sons. And now we see Jacob inverted. For Abba shows favoritism too. But he shows it to us. He shows it to us as he asked Jesus, who was worthy? Jesus, who was the firstborn? Jesus, who was the heir? He asked Jesus to suffer that many sons would come to glory. And because Jesus was a good son, Jesus is obedient, Jesus is the best big brother in the whole wide world, we get a coat. And you may be thinking to yourself, we get a coat of white, right? We get it out of Jesus' own wardrobe. When white is light, it is formed of every single color there is. Beloved, the white robes that we wear in eternity are the true coats of many colors that show that we are the favorite of God, each and every one of us. Whatever rags we had to cast aside beforehand, the coat of many colors that we get to pull lovingly out of Jesus' wardrobe marks us as the favorite son of God. And who am I? to receive such a gift. I am someone who has the right to be a child of God. That's who I am. And all my value is not determined by my blood, by my genetics. It is not determined by the will of the flesh, nor is it determined by the will of man. My value is determined by the will of God, by whom I cry, Abba, Father. Because, beloved, we get to have our own moment. I don't know if you notice in all three of those verses where we are told first that Jesus cried, Abba, Father, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that afterwards Paul reiterates for us in Romans that by which we cry, Abba, Father. And he says again in Galatians, the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. All the sons of God get to stand before Him. All of the sons of God get to stand before our Father and say, Abba, Father, all things are possible for You. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And unlike Jesus, our Father removes the cup from me. And He removes the cup from you. And you. And you. And you. For all things are possible. Because of the One who drank the cup so that we would not have to. And when we say, yet not my will, but your will be done, our will was to grasp that cup with both hands that we deserve. But it's the will of Abba, Father, that we not face the consequence for our sin, but that we be free, we be loved, that we be saved. Beloved, every child has a decision to make. Whatever their relationship with their father was, every child has a decision to make. Will I be just like my father or will I be nothing like him? 
Beloved, we get to make that choice because we've been given the right to be a son of God. We get to make that choice to be like Abba, to be just like Him, to be loving, to be forgiving, to be good. We have the power to choose now to be good. When the will of the flesh and the will of man and generations of blood that shed blood after blood had no power, but our spirit is willing. Our flesh may be weak, but our big brother was strong in the garden. And he took a cup so that the will of the Father could be done. And Abba, Father, thank you for answering my prayer and taking the cup from me that your will be done. Lord God Almighty, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your correction, Lord. We thank you that you show your love for us when you correct us, Lord, when you call us out of our sin, when you call us to your righteousness, when you call us to cast away our filthy rags, when you call us to don the robes of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you answer our prayer that you hear us, you incline your ear to hear us. And you take the cup from us, Lord. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus, that you fulfilled the will of Abba. And by your sacrifice, by your suffering, you have brought many of us to glory. May we never forget the love that was shown to us, the irrevocable love that was given to us. Thank you that by the Spirit of the will of God, by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, Your will, Your goodness is enabling us to reach beyond the limitations of our flesh and look to You and see for truth and call You by Your holy name, Abba. And may that name May that name be ever on our lips as we bring our sorrows and find not a cup, but a solution. In the name of Jesus Christ do we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.